Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're most welcome to join us this afternoon uh, for this uh, IIA webinar. And we're particularly uh, happy to welcome the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, uh, Mr. Murcia Gioana. Uh, we really appreciate your taking time, uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, to talk to us this afternoon. And we look forward to your presentation and the questions and answers. Uh, the session will, uh, will close at 1.05 p.m. Uh, and in the meantime, the Sec Deputy Secretary General will make a presentation of about 10 minutes of the beginning, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Just some administrative details. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll see on your screen. And uh, please do feel free to put the questions uh, during the course of the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them after the Deputy Secretary General's presentation. As time you can see is limited, we would very much appreciate if your questions were brief and if you could give your a name and affiliation when posing them. Uh, a reminder that today's presentation and questions and answers is on the record. And you can also uh, feel free to join with Twitter uh, at the handle IIEA. Um, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Gianna, uh, in his presentation and his answers to questions, um, he will discuss how the Alliance has responded to Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine, what the conflict means for NATO, and how the war has fundamentally changed the international order. So let me just um, formally introduce uh, Deputy Secretary General Di Gioana. Uh, he became NATO Deputy Secretary General in this October 2019, after a very distinguished domestic and international career. Mr. Gioana is the first Deputy Secretary General from Romania, and in fact, the first from any of the uh, countries that joined the Alliance after the end of the Cold War. He has served as a diplomat, including ambassador to the United States and politician in Romania as Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, from 2000 to 2004, and also as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He holds a PhD in economic studies from the Academy of Bu Bucharest, and he was made a commander of the National Order, the Star of Romania. He also uh, has been awarded the French Légion d'Honneur and the Italian Stella della Solidarietà. Uh, that doesn't do full justice, uh, Deputy Secretary General, to your extended CV, but uh, let me uh, now, uh, I have the pleasure of handing you the floor for your introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. That was too, too, too much of a generous introduction. Also, please add on my former CV, a great uh, friend of your great nation. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to join you all today um, and speak at such a critical time for European and global security. And the partnership between NATO and Ireland goes back almost 25 years now. In that time, we have worked together uh, in many, many ways. Ireland has contributed to NATO's missions in Bosnia, in Afghanistan, now it has troops as part of our mission in Kosovo. We work together to advance women, peace and security agenda and to increase uh, your capacity to participate in UN and EU missions. And we work together to enhance our interoperability uh, with, with the other forces. And here you have a long and proud tradition uh, taking part in the UN peacekeeping missions for everyone in the past 65 years. That's nothing short of a, rec of a record. But as I uh, discussed quite recently with your foreign and defense minister, Michael Martin, uh, uh, on the margins of the Munich Security Conference, NATO value its partnerships uh, and our partnership with Ireland in particular. Of course, Ireland is not a member of NATO. Uh, it is a neutral country. We respect uh, Ireland's neutrality. The right of sovereign nations to walk their own path, to choose their own security arrangements. This is fundamental uh, to our values. It's a key part of the UN Charter, which commits all nations to settle disputes peacefully, to respect sovereign borders, and to refrain from the threat of uh, or the use of force. But by invading Ukraine, a sovereign and independent nation, President Putin has shattered these commitments. He has declared war on the rule-based international order, as we know it and as we cherish it. While the world has been shocked by the brutality of Putin's war, we are not surprised. 
is only the latest bloody chapter in a long history of Russian aggression, from Grozny to Georgia, and from Aleppo to Crimea and the Donbass. In the, man, in the months running up to the last year's invasion, NATO allies shared precise intelligence about Russia's preparation for war. We worked hard right up to the last possible minute to persuade Putin to pull back from the brink. But despite for our calls for peace, Putin chose to attack. And when he did, he made two big strategic mistakes. First, he underestimated the extraordinary resilience of the Ukrainian armed forces. And he, uh, and he also underestimated the resolve of our free and democratic world to stand with Ukraine. One year now, now, despite his many setbacks, Putin is not preparing for peace. He's committed to more war. While the fighting continues, some lessons from this war are already clear to us. First, we must support Ukraine for as long as it takes and with whatever they need to win. NATO has been Ukraine's partner since it uh, first gained independence over 30 years ago. We stepped up our support when Putin illegally annexed Crimea in 2014, training and equipping tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. And the world now knows just what a formidable fighting force Ukraine's military is. Since Putin ordered these tanks to cross Ukraine's border a year ago, NATO allies have provided unprecedented support with over 100 billion euros of financial, humanitarian, and military assistance, including tanks, advanced air defense systems, munitions, and other military equipment. Ireland also contributes millions in euros to Ukraine through the UN, the Red Cross, and other international organizations. We must support Ukraine to win this war, because if Putin wins, he and other authoritarian leaders like him would learn a terrifying lesson that aggression works, that brutality works, that war works. We cannot let that happen. It would make the world more dangerous and all of us more vulnerable. So supporting Ukraine is not only the morally right thing to do, it's also serving our own interest. The Republic of Moldova, a fellow neutral country, is also exposed to the full arsenal of Russia's hybrid war toolkit. The second lesson is that we must continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense. We live in a more dangerous world and can, lo can longer afford to, to, to treat defense as optional. It is a necessity. And I know I'm a political guy myself. I know it is difficult to choose between social, economic investment programs, but also security is part of the essential things that nations have to do to defend their citizens. Security is the foundation of our freedom and prosperity. This is why NATO allies are committed to spending 2% of GDP on defense, and increasingly, 2% is viewed as a flaw and not a ceiling. For Finland and Sweden, until recently, uh, uh, for Finland, a neutral nation since the Second World War, and for Sweden from 1812, and they're so close geographically to Russia, the need to strengthen their defense has led to a dramatic reconsideration of their security interest and where those security interests lie. So after many, many, many years and centuries of neutrality, both countries applied for membership in the NATO alliance. These were historic decisions taken freely that demonstrate the desire of free nations to stand together and to decide their own destiny. So far, this has been the fastest succession process in NATO's modern history. All NATO allies invited uh, the two future allies to join at the Madrid summit in June uh, last year. 28 of the 30 allies have already ratified the accession protocols, and this sends already a strong message that violence and intimidation will not work, and NATO's door remains firmly open, and we are looking forward to receiving these two new allies very soon amongst our ranks. The third lesson is that we need to strengthen the resilience of our societies. Military forces are necessary, but they're not enough. Modern conflict is about far more than just guns and tanks. We must be every bit as concerned with the protection of our critical infrastructures, supply chains, cyberspace, or space assets. Resilient society is our first line of defense. They are better able to deter, to resist, and bounce back from attack, be them physical or digital. Even here in Ireland, far from the front line, Russia's presence is felt. Last year, Russia planned a naval exercise in Allah's exclusive economic zone. 
And following the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines, the security of undersea cables connecting Ireland to North America, the UK and Europe has come into sharp focus. So now NATO allies recently decided to establish a new critical undersea infrastructure coordination cell. It will engage with industry and bring key military and civilian stakeholders together to boost the security of our undersea infrastructure. As an advanced knowledge-based economy with thriving technology, pharmaceutical, biotech, financial sectors, ensuring Ireland's resilience will be critical in the years ahead. And this is where I believe our partnership could be put to work. The war against Ukraine has also demonstrated the danger of relying on authoritarian regimes. Russia's dependency on Russia's oil and gas made all of us vulnerable. We cannot make the same mistake with China or other authoritarian regimes on things like rare earth materials or vital, so vital for the transition away from fossil fuels. And I know for countries that are so trade-oriented and open societies and open economies like Ireland, keeping the international trade system and making it work is vital for your own interest. But the reality that we see a fragmentation of supply chains, we see economic resilience and a connection between security and economy becoming ever more present. And this is a fact. And I think all of us have to adjust to this new reality. So resilience uh, requires close cooperation between allies and partner countries, including Ireland, uh, other uh, organizations. And I, I have to say our number one partner, which is European Union. So we are stepping up our cooperation with the EU, including through the new NATO-EU joint declaration and a new joint task force on resilience and critical infrastructure. Resilience is a team sport, civilian and military, public and private sector, and empowered citizens who are essential to strong societies. So in the last past year, the world has changed fundamentally. We are living through the biggest security crisis in Europe since the Second World War. We are also living through the most transformative technological revolution ever. So our freedom does not come for free and cannot be taken for granted. And only working together, NATO allies, our partners around the globe, we can secure our future. We can secure our way of life. We can secure that our citizens will be free, prosperous, and resilient. So these are a few thoughts uh, from NATO uh, headquarters in Brussels. Uh, I know that Rose Goethemuller, my dear friend and predecessor, was in 2019 in person in Dublin for this conference. So if you uh, and I will be able to find um, a good, a good, a good uh, timing, I look forward to visiting Dublin. Uh, as I know, I love and respect your country and the partnership uh, with Ireland is very much cherished here in NATO. Thank you so much and I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, for your kind remarks and also for uh, your, your presentation, which has situated, uh, presented the situation so starkly and so clearly and so importantly. Uh, I have just one question uh, to start. Uh, start with, uh, I'm afraid we have a number of questions, but may I ask you, are you satisfied, is NATO satisfied that there is sufficient um, material and support for Ukraine uh, now and will it continue? Uh, are countries running short of ammunition? Are you satisfied that the effort will be sufficient to bolster Ukraine to continue this war? Thank you. That's a very valid question, uh, Mary. I think there are two components here. One is the political will for allies and partners. 50 countries around the world are in the Rammstein uh, process, in the contact group for Ukraine, working day in and day out with our Ukrainian uh, partners just to see how can we dynamically uh, respond to their needs as the situation uh, on the ground evolves. So politically, I, I would say we are very united. I, I, uh, I just, uh, we just had the defense ministers in NATO uh, two weeks back. We had the Rammstein group. I think politically, uh, we are we are fine. We are we are united, and the will uh, to continue to help uh, is there. Now, you touched on a, on, a, on an important issue. For many many years and decades in Europe, we collected the peace dividend after the fall of communism. We all did. Countries, uh, let's say, uh, in, uh, in NATO, countries in the EU, uh, 
countries like Switzerland, uh, you know, uh, everyone, including our countries, my country, uh, my home country of Romania and Poland and the others, we also joined NATO and the EU. All of us, in a way, thrived and prospered um, in a sort of a benign strategic environment. One of the, <laughs> the implications of such, such a relatively benign strategic uh, reality in Europe is that we started to underinvest in our defense, in our stockpiles, in our industrial capacity, and Ukraine is a wake-up call that we have to do much more. So I'm confident that allies are ramping up production. NATO is sending a very strong demand signal to the industries. I see already contracts uh, offered by governments to their, uh, to their industry. Also for the EU, in a way, I think it's a wake-up call. I'm a EU citizen. I'm coming from Romania, also a EU member state. And I think also the huge fragmentation in the EU defense industry needs to be overcome somehow. So I think that we'll be uh, spending more, spending better. NATO is changing our requirements for minimum stockpile levels for us. And of course, being able to continue to provide Ukraine uh, with the amounts uh, of support that they, they need. So on the first front, politically, we are very united. On the second one, uh, there is an effort that all of us need to make. Thank you. Thank you for that reply. Um, Deputy Secretary General, you mentioned undersea uh, cables, and that certainly touches a nerve here in Ireland. And I have a number of questions from uh, Conor Gallagher, Irish Times, and Conor O'Keefe, uh, Cormac O'Keefe, Irish Examiner, um, about the um, undersea security uh, cell. Is that something that you see that Ireland would cooperate with or will it be involved in uh, working with, uh, with NATO uh, on the undersea cell um, cooperation? Because of course, uh, there are such significant uh, cables uh, leading into the country uh, that it's a, a matter of considerable um, worry to us here. I discussed with your Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence and former Prime Minister in Munich. I mentioned this in my, in my remarks. And uh, I think there is interest uh, for Ireland, but also I met the, uh, the Foreign Minister of Malta, same interest. I met the Foreign Minister of Jordan, same interest. I met the Secretary General of the Gulf Cooperation Council, same interest. Because I think we touched a, a very sensitive and real uh, point of concern to all of us. I remember I was chairing the North Atlantic Council when we, when we invited three CEOs to brief the council on this very thing. The CEO of the Swedish electricity company, uh, the CEO of the Norwegian oil and gas company, and the lead engineer for Google, the largest uh, you know, um, owner and, 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 uh, and provider of undersea uh, uh, data transmission through fiber optics on the, on the seabed. And, that's a clear understanding that this is something that is at the intersection between governments, private sector, defense, and local authorities. So this cell we are now establishing, it will be a sort of a conglomerate of, this, of these actors. So of course, if Ireland will be interested in, in our already very dynamic partnership to, to find ways to cooperate also on this topic, we'll be very open to that proposition. Thank you for that. Yes. Another aspect of this war, um, Deputy Secretary General, uh, in disinformation and espionage, uh, Cormac O'Keefe, a journalist, uh, is um, probably rife throughout the EU. Um, do individual countries, do you feel, need to do more about this uh, in the context of the war overall? Um, are we combating uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation in this regard sufficiently? No, Russia, Russia has been doing this against our interests for years now. And I cannot say which country did well and which country did not do that well. But I know that this hybrid warfare arsenal against our interests uh, is a tool of preference, and, and this is something that Russia is now only uh, amplifying. So that's why we need to take this issue very seriously. It's not only uh, fighting uh, espionage, that I think our counterintelligence is the job description, but that's something very, very uh, pervasive uh, in basically amplifying the fractures in our own societies. In some cases, even funding 
parties that are against uh, the the uh, the Western orientation in our nations, the cyber attacks, um, uh, many issues that are basically what they call it here in NATO, just under the threshold of Article Five, and also because there is this uh, difficult time for Russia and Ukraine, they are amplifying. Um, this kind of horizontal escalation of hybrid warfare against our interest in the West. And we see this, uh, and together in NATO, together NATO and the EU, together on this information, NATO, EU and the G7, we have a working group working together, and also reaching out to private sector to help us with that. I'm not mentioning uh, specific corporations because I don't want to, to uh, to be to be making any kind of uh, of marketing for anyone, but I have to say that in NATO, in the EU, I think each of our nations are also working with private sector, because they have first-hand information about cyber protection. Uh, they are the ones who can also identify a, a, and debunk um, the conspiracy theories that are banned uh, coming from Russia and sometimes also from China. To speak of a of a cyber attack our Albanian uh, friends and allies here in NATO, they had a very powerful cyber attack from Iran against the Ministry of the Interior in Tirana uh, just, I think, a few months back. So that's why resilience is a theme sport, as I mentioned. Fighting disinformation is part of that. And I think that the uh, uh, open free societies, and Ireland is an example of an open free society and democratic society, we have to find democratic and free answers to this kind of uh, very corrosive actions uh, that Russia and others are taking. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, headlining a warning uh, to us all, I think, and to all countries in, in Europe in that regard. Uh, could I turn uh, and um, to the United States, um, Deputy Secretary General, a colleague and former ambassador uh, to the United States, uh, to the US and Germany, Noel Fahey is asking, uh, about the United States um, commitment uh, to the um, to the war, um, uh, I'm adding on. Uh, I we're hoping that it will continue. We're conscious that there is an American presidential election uh, coming uh, down uh, down the tracks. Um, but um, Noel Fahey's question is: Do you see the U.S. Pivot to Asia as a distraction to security in Europe, uh, particularly, of course, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, preoccupation with China. Uh, we've had um, a Chancellor Schultz visiting there uh, and, uh, and a commitment to continue the, uh, the support for Ukraine, but just your view on, on the US involvement in the war and also uh, certain distractions with China. You know, you, you know America well, uh, you're so much intertwined with, with the very fabric of the American society. Um, but I also know American well. I served there as a very young ambassador. I was foreign minister. Um, I'm a politician, and I think I know America well. I think one of the uh, bipartisan uh, realities rediscovered by our American friends and allies is to put in the word of Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, in his address in, the, in, the, in a session of the Joint Congress a few years back, it's good to have friends. And I think America discovered in this huge competition against China and now Russia and Iran and whoever else, that the, the system of alliances and partnerships around the world, in Europe and around the world, is something that America has as its number one strategic asset. Of course, it has a very dynamic country, a still very young country, a country that can, is, is economically, technologically, and militarily uh, a global superpower. But they realize that in these very com complex times, allies are just so precious. And this is bipartisan. I was looking to a poll conducted by the, uh, the Chicago uh, uh, Council on, on World Affairs. And there's something close to 70 something percent of Americans believe NATO is a great alliance serving America's interests. There's no other organization in the world, and America has now 31 allies in one organization. And our close connections to Japan, to Australia, to South Korea, and New Zealand as NATO, their leaders are coming to our summits starting last year. They'll be coming also in Vilnius this year. So I heard this, uh, this sort of a litany that America is pivoting towards Asia since, I think, President Obama. 
I hear it every single time when there is a change of administration. I tell you one thing, America's alliances are the best asset for us. America's involvement in European security is our interest. And for America, having so many allies in Europe and elsewhere is also a plus. And many of the threats that will be all of us will be faced will, be faced, will not be geographical, Mary. Some of them like cyber, like technology, like space, like new technologies, like biotech, many places where your country excels are non geographical by nature. Some are geographical. The competition for uh, the future of Africa. We need all the resources we have for Asia, for Latin America. So to be honest, I'm not that concerned uh, about the risk that American political leadership and the American public uh, will go away from its traditional alliances in Europe. I think that on the other way, also Europe needs to understand that we have to fight uh, and, 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 and push back against challenges that are also non-European, but also global. So I'm pretty confident that this, uh, this alliance and America's leadership in this alliance will continue for, for more than uh, 70 years, since 75 since we were started uh, at the end of the Second World War. That's very reassuring. Thank you. And as you said, we're, we're special friends with America. Uh, and uh, we, that's good. That's good to hear that. I have many, many questions, but uh, there is one uh, that that has recurred. Uh, I think Shona Murray from Euronews puts it. Are you confident that Hungary and Turkey will eventually ratify the Sweden and Finland uh, accession? Since it appears that um, um, President Orban, uh, that Prime Minister Orban is using his vote as leverage against the EU for rule of law issues. That's quite a tangle between the EU and NATO. Uh, but obviously, um, we're all interested to know if that um, that the membership of Sweden and Finland will be unblocked, um, Deputy Secretary General. Let me, let me uh, just remind everyone um, that in Madrid, when we invited all 30 allies by consensus, we invited Sweden and Finland to join, that was done uh, you know, by consensus. So now we are just in the process of ratification. I'm not in the position to tell any democracy or any government or national parliament uh, when to ratify and how fast they should do it. We all hope that uh, the already the, the 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 commitment to these countries that we took in Madrid will be completed as soon as possible, noting that this is the fastest succession process ever, at least since the fall uh, of communism. So. Uh, I cannot say which are the domestic reasons uh, for uh, the two countries uh, yet not to ratify. I will mention also something which is very, very important when it comes to our Turkish allies. They've been going through tremendous challenges after the earthquake. That's a nation that has been suffering from terrorism for decades, like probably no one, no one else. So when under the auspices of our Secretary General in Madrid, we negotiated this trilateral memorandum between Tur Turkey, Sweden and Finland, and it was basically Turkey and, and Sweden. Finland um, uh, uh, has a little bit less concern from, uh, from Ankara on terrorism. Uh, we are also expecting uh, the, uh, all the parties to deliver on their promises in the memorandum. And I think we'll have this week in Brussels after the visit of Secretary General Stoltenberg to Ankara and meeting President Erdogan, um, uh, a new fresh start of the meeting between the three in order to, to advance these things. I also have to say that Sweden, uh, uh, as you know, in Ireland, uh, a EU member state is also chairing the EU pres uh, Council presidency. And I think that what Sweden has done in convening a donor conference for Turkey for reconstruction and being also so forthcoming uh, in answering to some of the legitimate concerns from Turkey I think in the end they will be conducive for a full ratification uh, by all allies and then uh, with great pride and joy will be uh, depositing the instrument ratification the state department according uh, to the rules of the washington right. treaty yes uh, we we wish that that process well uh, i think we we're running close to um to the time uh, coming up a last question um deputy secretary general the eu and nato have uh, developed a very increasing cooperation can you tell us how is the eu cooperating with nato in the uh, support for the, uh, the ukrainians in this war 
No, thank you. That's, that's, uh, that's I would say, is nothing short of remarkable. I think last week we had here in NATO HQ, uh, I think a few yards from the place I'm talking to you right now, the first ever meeting between our Secretary General, uh, Jose Borrell, uh, and Mito Kuleba from Ukraine. So a sign of, of, of direct coordination at leadership level between the, the two organizations in our help to, to Ukraine. Um, we also have uh, many other strands of work uh, with the EU in helping Ukraine. We also have a number of joint partnerships, NATO and the EU, to support other countries that need our support. And one is Moldova, the other one is Bosnia. Another one more to the south is Jordan and Tunisia. And we are actively working with the EU to, 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 to deepen and broaden uh, the level of partnerships that we do. In our joint declaration that we just signed just, I think, one month ago, we identified new uh, avenues of deeper cooperation between NATO and EU on resilience, on cyber, on new technologies, on space, on the climate change and security, where I believe also Ireland uh, will be interested in the tremendous progress that NATO is making on this very, very topic. And of course, global competition, because uh, this is not just a European situation, it's a global situation. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the European project. Uh, by the way, I have the European Constitution side by my own hand at home. Oh. Uh, and I'm still a little bit sad uh, that didn't go, didn't go through. So yeah, uh, lots, lots of synergies and, and a very, very uh, strong partnership between our two organizations. That's very, that's very interesting to know. Um, I think we have come to the end of our discussion. We greatly appreciate you joining us. I think you've opened a lot of uh, windows uh, for us in, uh, in discussing the, the fight against um, uh, what is happening uh, and the support that's been given uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we wish you well in promoting this uh, it's you have a lot of work and a lot of responsibility, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us today to explain in greater detail um, the challenges that Ukraine is facing and which we hope they will uh, continue to uh, to progress and to do well in this war, which is not of their choice and uh, which is totally unprovoked. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Mircea. Uh, it was a pleasure to see you. We do hope you will come to uh, Ireland uh, when time is less pressing for you, but thank you again for joining I think, us. Today. I think the Belgian embassy, which is the contact point embassy in Dublin for NATO, and also my good friend, the Romanian ambassador, uh, uh, Laurentiu, will, will, be, will be encouraging me uh, to come and uh, I look forward also to, to seeing you Mary and your colleagues in person and again I'm a great fan of your country uh, and I'm a great fan of our partnership. Well thank you very much indeed you would be most welcome here. Uh, thank you again Doctor, uh, and good wishes. Thank you to everybody who's joined us today.